I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Jonah chapter 4. Jonah chapter 4, and as you're turning there, we're going to be uh, wrapping up this series that we'll be calling, we've been calling Man Overboard. Man Overboard. Jonah was overboard. He, he wasn't on board with God. He went overboard. And as we're, as we're turning there, uh, let me just say, first of all, we need to be in prayer for the people of Texas. I know we mentioned it a little earlier, but just keep them in, in your prayers because it's been less than a year that we went through the same thing. And for us, the eye wall was like 30 miles offshore. If it would come on shore, we would have been in a lot worse hurt than we've been in. But now they're going through it, probably even in greater impact. And we need to really be in prayer for the people of Rockport, Texas, the people in the Houston area. They're going to be dealing with flooding for a long time. So uh, please, please, please keep them in your prayers, okay? And the second thing I want to say to you is this. Do you realize that this past week you shared something with the people of ancient Nineveh? You know, last Monday, remember they had the eclipse of the sun, and I talked to some of you out there in the atrium today, and you said you were in totality, went to that area where there's a total eclipse of the sun. Well, I want you to know that uh, in the year 763 B.C., in the years when Jonah was serving as a prophet of the Lord in the city of Nineveh, there was a total eclipse of the sun. Yeah, so that's something we share with the people that Jonah talked to. As a matter of fact, some Bible scholars say, and we have no way of proving this, But some Bible scholars even say that that because there was an eclipse that it might have made their hearts more open to hearing a word from the Lord. That when the prophet came in, they were more open to hearing it because it was such an unusual event. We don't know that. We don't know that for sure. But I know that we have something in common with the people of ancient Nineveh. They experienced this total eclipse of the sun. And they saw saw God's hand in that. And uh, there's another thing I hope we have in common with the people of Nineveh. They heard God's word and they repented. And I pray that we do the same thing. I pray that we hear God's word and we make whatever turn, whatever adjustments we need to make. And you know, repent is not a bad word. You know, we we think of repenting as as being this judgmental word and has all these negative connotations. Repent is not a bad word. It is not. It simply just means you're, you're going to a certain direction. You're just turning and you're turning toward God. And the whole theme of the book of Jonah is this. What is God likely to do when a person, when a people, when a nation turns back to him? What's God likely to do? It's not bad things. It's great things. Repent and turn to God that your sins may be blotted out and that times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. I mean, that's good stuff, right? And so what's God likely to do when we repent? That's not just, he's not heaping guilt on us. He's heaping blessings. So I'm praying that if we hear the word of God and something is speaking to you, that you, don't just, you just don't leave this place not responding to what God is obviously telling you to do. Whether it's a change of your heart posture, whether it's a change of behavior, whether it's making that, that first decision to trust in Jesus Christ to forgive your sins to trust in Jesus Christ to, to be the Lord of your life and direct your life. Whatever it is, I pray that if we need to adjust our lives in any way, let's repent and turn to God that our sins might be blotted out and that times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. That's what it's all about, okay? So anyway, Jonah chapter four, the context of this at this point is that the people of Nineveh had repented. Jonah went in there in one day and uh, the first day, and people started repenting, and, and revival was breaking out right and left. Okay, an amazing, amazing movement of God in this, in this enemy city of Nineveh. And let's see how Jonah reacted. Would you please stand with me in honor of God's word as I read Jonah chapter 4. This is what the word of God says. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. And he was angry. And he prayed to the Lord and said, O Lord... Is, this, is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? That is why I made haste to, haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and relenting from disaster. Therefore now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. A little overreaction there. And the Lord said, Do you do well to be angry? 
Jonah went out of the city, sat to the east of the city, and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade till he could, should see what would become of the city. Now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was exceedingly glad because of the plant. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God appointed a scorching east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint. And he asked that he might die and said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry, angry enough to die. And the Lord said, you pity the plant for which you did not labor, nor did you make it grow, which came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should not I pity Nineveh, that great city, in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also much cattle. Lord Jesus, I thank you for these words. And Lord, I pray that, that we would be able to take your heart and appropriate it into our lives, Lord, to incorporate it. Lord, that, that the filling of your love would do something tremendous in us, Lord, that, that our hearts would be in alignment. And Lord, that we'd please you. In your precious name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Okay, so as we're going through this book, we see Jonah didn't have a great reaction to God's mercy. He didn't have a great reaction at all to, to God's love and compassion on the people of Nineveh. And uh, I want to just recap some truths here that we've learned earlier. See, God had a plan, and at first Jonah was not on board with that plan. He was overboard. But uh, realize that right now at the end, God, he doesn't seem like Jonah's still on God's plan. It seems like he's still off track with God. And if you look in chapter 1, here's a truth we found from chapter 1. God's plan is never overboard. It's never overboard. God's, God's plan, Jonah thought God's plan was overboard. It's never overboard. It's always redemptive. God had sent Jonah out on this impossible task, this task to go spread this message of judgment to the biggest, baddest enemy in the neighborhood, and he shared that th thing of judgment. And Jonah thought that God was being overboard, and he wasn't. Jonah was the one who went overboard, but he didn't go overboard because he followed God's plan. He found himself in a bad place because he didn't follow God's plan. Now, the second thing comes from Jonah chapter 2. And in Jonah chapter 2, we find that God's plan is never overboard, but his compassion is. His compassion is overboard. He loves you more than you deserve. He loves me more than I deserve. He's overboard with love for you. He loves you so much he created you. He has a plan for your life. He has a purpose for your life. He has a destiny for you to spend eternity with Jesus in heaven. That's the plan, okay? His plan's not overboard, but his compassion is. And here we found Jonah. He was in over his head. He was in the belly of the fish. He couldn't save himself. But you know what was stronger than his circumstance? The love and power of God. And his love is so overboard, God went in after him. Got him out of the belly of the fish. And he has the desire and ability in your life to take whatever situation you are in, and he can bring victory out of every situation. That's his love for you. He has overboard love for you. He loves you even though you don't deserve it. Now, the next thing we find from Jonah 3. Use second chances for sacred changes. God gives second chances. There are opportunities of second time grace. It's all throughout the Bible. It happened to Jonah. It happened to the people of Nineveh. God, the, the Bible is just full of people that are given second chances. But I don't believe God gives you a second chance. You do the same old thing over and over again, repeating the same mistakes over and over and over again. God gives you second chances so you can make sacred changes. So you can live in more holiness that you can receive more of the blessings that he intends for your life. You know, because what's likely to happen when people repent and turn to God? Well, you repent and turn to God that your sins may be blotted out and that times of refreshing would come from the presence of the Lord. That's why he does this. Now, it's easy to say we need to overcome the issues of our heart. Jonah needed to overcome. It's so easy to say if you're not living in it. Uh, I want to talk about overcoming those heart issues that we have and some clues that I see here in Jonah chapter 4. But it is easy to see, but it is, it is easier to say than it is to do because you see, we, we, we are born into flesh. We have this flesh nature, we have this sin nature, and the sin nature, this is where our heart, our overboard heart, 
the sin nature runs deep. And, and it's hard to overcome that. And we cannot overcome it except in the power of the Lord. Okay, but we have this sin nature in us. And, and, and here are some clues I see to overcoming that sin nature, overcoming the posture of our heart. And when I look at, at Jonah chapter 4, and, and notice here in Jonah chapter 4, verse 1, this is how Jonah responded to God's compassion. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. He wasn't just... He wasn't just ticked off. It displeased him exceedingly. Literally in the Hebrew, it, was, it says it was evil to Jonah with great evil. It was evil that God would spare those people. I mean, he, he didn't like that. You know, in chapter 1, it uses this word evil to talk about Nineveh. Now it's using the word evil to talk about Jonah. It's ironic about that same word. It's incredible how quickly we can be in the center of God's will. And then just with a thought... We find our outside of God's plan. You know, it doesn't even have to be an action. It can be just a, a posturing of our heart. It is so incredibly how quick we can move from God's will to being back in rebellion against God. God showed compassion to that city, and it just burned Jonah up. Or as they say here in the South, it ate him up. It ate him up that God was going to show compassion. Yeah, I, I don't know why. It, it burned Jonah up. It, there are several reasons. It could be that the Ninevite, Ninevites, because they were the enemy, you know, we don't want good things to happen to the enemy, right? I mean, we want, we want the good things to happen to the gators and the bad things to happen to the tide, right? Isn't that how it works? And it's always about them and us, okay? We want the good things to happen to us, the bad things to happen to them. Or it could be that, that Jonah was a prophet, okay? He was, he was a prophet, and, and he might have realized that sometime within the next 40 years, the Ninevites are going to be instrumental in totally obliterating the northern kingdom of Israel. Within 40 years, the Ninevites are going to be a part of, you know, they're, they're the lost tribes of Israel. When the Ninevites came in, the Assyrians came in, we have no record of them after that date. So it's very possible he knew what was going on, and maybe he was just absolutely disgusted that God would use him as an instrument to bring repentance to the people that were going to obliterate the northern kingdom. Maybe that was it. Or maybe his reputation, you know. Here he's a prophet. He's calling down judgment from God. And, and now the judgment's not happening. And what are people going to think of him? Maybe that burned him up. And he says, God, you're kind of making me out to be a liar. Or perhaps he was disillusioned. Because you see, Jonah had spent his whole life as a prophet. And he'd been going to the northern kingdom. And the northern kingdom of Israel at that time, it was, it was prosperous. Things were going well financially. They were in a good condition, but spiritually they were bankrupt. Spiritually they were, they were worshiping false idols. They were going away from God. They were going closer and closer away from God. The judgment of God was impending on them. And he had spent his whole ministry just telling them that, that you need to turn because God has his judgment on the northern kingdom here. The judgment is coming on Israel. You need to watch out and be careful. And, and, and it's falling on deaf ears and then he goes to the enemy one day and they start turning and he's thinking what's this about how come our people won't turn but they do you know um, I don't know what it is but for whatever reason Jonah's heart was not on board with God he and God were not tracking together he still had overboard issues in his heart and look at the prayer in verse 2 the prayer in verse 2 he prayed to the Lord and said oh Lord is not this what I said when I was yet in my country? Look at how it's so focused on himself. This is what I said when I was in my country. That is why I made haste to flee to Tarshish, for I knew that you're a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, relenting from disaster. If you're going to complain about God, this does not seem like a list of things you ought to be complaining about, honestly. But, but he is. And it, the prayer continues on in verse 3 in the same vein. If you're looking at it in the ancient language, the original language, the word I, my, or me occurs nine different times in two verses. Very selfish prayer. Probably one of the most selfish prayers ever recorded in the Bible. You know, uh, and the truth is that Jonah's heart was not like God's heart. What was God's heart like? Gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Okay, that was, that was God's heart. Jonah's heart, anger. Yeah, just, just, just not right there, you know. And uh, God's heart, and, and these words Jonah would have known, gracious, merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. You know, if you're going to track with God's plan, you have to align with God's heart. 
If you're going to track with God's plan, you have to align with God's heart. You have to be in the same heart path that God is. And the way we do that is we need to abide and bound in steadfast love. And you can write this down. Abide and abound in steadfast love. In that chesed love, that, that word love, it's, it's, it means compassion, mercy, loving kindness, enduring love. There isn't one single word in English that really fits it real well, but, but you know, it's, it's a steadfast love. And we need to abide and abound in steadfast love. And it's more than just knowing that God, God is full of love. We need to abide in that love. Um, when Jonah's praying, he says, I know that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Jonah wasn't making that up. This wasn't the first time that you see these words in the Bible. As a matter of fact, this is a formula. This is an ancient creed. We find it in Exodus. Moses wrote it down in Exodus chapter 34. He said, this is our God. He is, he is, he is a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. Ten different times in the Bible, uh, like in Psalm 86 and, and eight other places, we see this exact phrase describing God. This was like a formula. This is something that says, if you know anything about God, you need to know that God is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Okay? Uh, and it's alluded to in a lot of other places in the Bible as well. This is what people knew about God. And so if I were to say to you, God is love, it should not surprise you. That's not a headline, right? God is love. We all know God is love. If I go to the preschool department right now and I say, what, tell me about God, I'm sure there'd be a preschooler saying, God is love. Because you know, that's, that's, that's just truth. We know God is love. But knowing about God being love and abiding in that love are two totally different planes. You see, if you're going to abound in his love, you have to first abide in his love. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments... You'll abide in my love just as I've kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. What that means is if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you're seeking him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Well, there's a foundation, and that foundation is that he loves you. It's that overboard compassion. It's that love that you don't deserve, that, that he has love for you, and that's the foundation of everything. And you start with this, God loves me. God loves me. I don't have to earn his love. He already loves me. That's the foundation. And I let through my life, I let him fill me up with love. And then as I abound in love, I can share that love with other people around me. But you got to start there. If you, be, if you want to be on God's heart, you want to overcome the issues of your heart, you got to start with this, that God loves you. you got to abide in his love, and then you got to abound in his love. you got to let that love grow, okay? Now, you know, if we miss abiding in his love, then we miss God's plan. And if we miss God's plan, we miss the joy that he has, desired, he has planned for you. So, so you need to abide in that love. And you need, to, you need to see that joy of other people joining God's plan and also abiding in his love and them abounding in his love and so on and so on. That's God's kingdom. That's what, he's, that's what he has for us. Now, verse six, something else. It says, now the Lord God appointed a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from his discomfort. God was giving him an object lesson. He was going to show him, here's where the comfort zone is, okay? Literally, this is to deliver him from his evil. And it says here that Jonah was exceedingly glad, okay? In, in uh, verse 1, he's exceedingly angry because God saved Nineveh. Now this plant comes up and he's exceedingly glad. This is deliriously happy. It's like he's jumping up and down saying, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, there's a plant coming up. I'm going to have more shade. He is so happy about it. He's watching it come up and go and he's thinking, oh man, this is awesome. Isn't God good? He's giving me this plant. Okay. And you say, that's a little overboard, isn't it? Well, you need to understand back in that day, and like it is today, the average high temperature in that area of the world is 110 degrees, okay? Any bit of shade is something that's good. And you know, there's not a lot of plant life that's growing out there in the wilderness. And so you want to get in the shade because being in the shade is the matter of life and death. And so God gave him shade and he's, he's jumping up and down happy. And that shade might represent what God does for me, but also the, the shade represents a self-imposed prison. It's a prison of our own comfort. 
know what I'm talking about? Sometimes we imprison ourselves in our own comfort and, and we limit ourselves because we, we, we think about what God is doing and we don't think about how we're supposed to serve God. We're more focused on what God is going to do to serve us. And it's like we turn faith around and we focus it on ourselves. You know, um, I think phones are just amazing these days. I have this phone. I brought it up with me. And, you know, I can do all kinds of things with this telephone except maybe make a phone call. Um, <clears throat> But, you know, I can, I can take a picture of all you guys out here and everybody that's there. But, you know, what's really even neat. I press a little button and it turns it around. I can take a picture of myself. <laughs> isn't that awesome? Isn't that, isn't that awesome? You know, I can take a picture of myself. Hey, you guys are there. Why don't y'all wave and get in my selfie picture? There we go. <laughs> great, great. There's a great selfie of me, of me preaching. Because, you know, that faith, it's all about me, isn't it? You know, it's, it's not about the Word of God. It's me preaching in front of a lot of people. Isn't that great? And then I also have something else here, too. You know what this is? Yeah, you know what this is, don't you? This is a selfie stick. I mean, like, my phone can do all kinds of things. But let me tell you something. With this stick, this whole purpose of this stick is for me to put a better focus on myself. So I can have better pictures of myself. I mean, isn't that amazing? I can see more of you in the picture. Hey, y'all, y'all, uh, wave there. Give me a good wave. Everyone say, Jesus. Jesus. Ain't God good. <laughs> and I can focus all of faith on me. Well, you see, some of us, we have what I would like to call selfie stick faith. <laughs> and we work faith and we turn it around on ourselves and we have this selfie fixation and let me tell you something if you're just focused on yourself you're really limited in the scope of what you can do and you know we do that we have this we have this selfie fixation and we need to escape the limits of selfie fixation we need to escape the limits of saying that well this faith is what I'm what I'm getting out of it this is me getting fed you know if you're asking the question what is God's plan for my life? If you're asking that question, what is God's plan for my life? You really don't have the right question. You're even asking the wrong question. The question is not, what is God's plan for my life? The question is, God, what is your plan? What is your plan? And how do I need to adjust my plan? How do I need to turn? How do I need to repent in order to align with your plan? That's the question. Because when I, when I talk about what is God's plan for my life, I still have this selfie focus going on, right? God, what is your plan? Show me what I need to do to adjust to your plan. See, God has a plan for your life, and it includes serving him. Sometimes we want to know what God's going to do to serve us, but, but serving God, that's what it's all about. God has a plan, and it's, it's helping others embrace his life changed youth, other people finding redemption. That's what his plan is. You know, now's the season when our preschool children, youth workers, the, the uh, kids' praise uh, leadership, they're all trying to recruit workers for the coming year, okay? And, and so many times they tell me, we'll approach these people, but here's the answer we get back from some people. We get this idea that when I come to church, you know, uh, it's great that you do something, but, but this is my time. This is my time. This is when I'm here to get fed. That's what church is about. I need to get fed. I'm with the kids all week long, and, and I need to be fed, and I, can't, I, I, I can't, can't commit to doing anything that way. Now, we do want excellent ministries for our kids here at church, and we think the church should provide excellent ministries. Well, when the church is providing, who do you think is providing those ministries? Do you think we have an Amazon Prime subscription and we get a box of nursery workers that get mailed to us every week? That is not how it happens, okay? Just want you to know that. They're not coming uh, off-site. When the church is providing, it's the body doing what the body is doing. And I want you to know, if you get out and you serve, you don't have to serve every week. If you serve one Sunday and you, and you uh, attend a service another Sunday or you serve one hour and attend another hour, you can strike that right balance of being fed and serving. Do you realize when you serve the Lord, you're going to grow more? When you serve the Lord, you're going to feel the power of God more. When you serve the Lord, you're going to see him bless others through you. But sometimes we're limited by this, our own selfie fixation that it's all about me. No, it's about the kingdom. It's about the kingdom. And you know, we need to escape the limits of our selfie foundation. 
uh, our selfie fixation. Now let's, let's move on here. And so God, God helped Jonah get past that. Here's what he did. He, he appointed the plant, but then he appointed a worm to attack the plant and it withered. Then he appointed a wind to come in and, and blow all this hot air right on his face and dry him up. And then the sun's beating down. God is really working in Jonah's life. And Jonah's, Jonah's saying, God, if you're working, I wish you wouldn't work this way. This is hard. This is hard. He said, please let me die. It's better for me to die than to live. What in the world was God doing? What in the God world was God doing? And God asked him the question, do you do well to be angry for the plant? And he said, yes, I do well to be angry. Angry enough to die. What was God doing? Here's what God was doing. He was intervening in Jonah's life to break the momentum of his overboard heart. You see, our hearts, our hearts, our lives in the flesh, they gather momentum. And sometimes there are things that we do that are against God's plan that we don't even realize it. And we have a momentum in the sin of our life. And sometimes, and sometimes God has to use some extreme measures to get our attention. And he has to break the momentum of our sin and, make the momentum, and break the momentum of the, of the posturing of our heart. And sometimes he works in ways that make us uncomfortable. But you see, Jonah had been traveling down this path a long time. This path of not being in line with God's point of compassion. You know? So God was using his power. When God uses his power to bring discomfort into your life, it's not because God hates you. I hear people tell me, I don't know what's going on. God must hate me. No, he doesn't hate you. He absolutely does not hate you. He is overboard in love with you. And if he's bringing something into your life, he's only bringing it in because he loves you. He's trying to break the momentum that's leading you to destruction. He loves you. And he wants you to be aligned with him. And he wants you to have that heart of his heart, that, that compassion. But, but maybe you have hurts in the past that have gained momentum. It's hard for you to have compassion. It's hard for you, hard for you to be slow to anger. It's hard for you to show mercy. It's hard for you to bound in that steadfast love. And sometimes God uses extreme measures to speak into your life. And he's speaking into our lives. He's saying, you need to learn. And, and I just want to say, accept the power of God to break that momentum. Accept God's power to break that overboard momentum in your life. Because he's only doing it because he loves you. Do you ever wonder, as I'm going through this book, contemplating... Did Jonah ever get it? Did Jonah ever get it? I mean, do you think about it? He started off the book, and, and he is in rebellion against God, running from God. He ends the book. He's angry and defiant against God. Do you think he really ever got what it meant to be aligned with God's heart? I can't prove this, but in my sanctified imagination, okay, in the way I think, in my sanctified imagination, I believe this. You know, Jonah's chapter 2 and 4, the only people there were Jonah and God. No one other than Jonah and God knew what Jonah prayed in the belly of the whale. No one knew that conversation between God and Jonah. In my sanctified imagination, years later, an older and wiser Jonah, a little worse for wear, gave a testimony. And he said, let me tell you how God had to intervene in my life to show me that he is a love of grace and compassion, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. Because it, it was hard for me to learn that lesson. God had to do some amazing things. I, you know, some people say that Jonah's a parable, some's just this didactic teaching story, whatever. I think it's a testimony. I think Jonah told this to somebody who wrote this down and said, this is an amazing life lesson that we all need to learn. And that it's never too late to get back in line with God. But if I'm going to align with God's plan, I've got to align with God's heart. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know if it's something that's behavioral and everyone knows that you're sinning and you need to repent and turn. Or if there's just this hardness of your heart that is developed against another person, another group of people, or even an unwillingness to follow God and do the things he's called you to do. But whatever it is, it's time to turn to God. Repent and turn to God that your sins may be blotted out and that times of refreshing may come. Today, in your life, what's likely to happen? 
what is God likely to do if you turn to him and you move closer to him? He'll do amazing things. He'll do amazing things. You just say, Lord, here's my heart. Use it. Do amazing things with it. And he will. He will. I'm praying for someone. If you know, if if God's calling you to make a public decision, I'm going to be here at the front. We're going to have counselors over there at the desk, over there under that lighthouse. You just go see them, okay? We'll help you take that step. Because it's very, very, very important for us not to be people that have hardened our ears and our hearts to God's message. Let's be like those ancient Ninevites that when they heard the word of God, they turned and they repented. Their sins were blotted out in times of refreshing came. I pray for that refreshing in your life. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much. Hi, my name is Walter West. I'm the lead pastor of Anastasia Baptist Church, and thank you for joining us for this latest installment of Real Life, Real Hope Messages. In this series of messages that we're calling Overboard as we go through the book of Jonah, uh, one of the things that, that I want us to understand is that we all go overboard. There are ways that, that we walk away from God. When we go overboard, it puts us in a place of danger. And the only way to get out of that place of danger is the rescue that comes from Jesus Christ. I just want to invite you to, to ask Jesus into your heart if you've never done that before. If we can help you in any way, please feel free to contact us. Uh, you can contact us here at Anastasia Church. Uh, you can go online at www.anastasiachurch.org. Or uh, you can call us on the telephone. The phone number is 904-471-2166. Or you can come by and see us in person. Anastasia Baptist Church, Anastasia Church, we're we're found locally in the St. Augustine, Florida area, and we're trying to help people embrace the life-changing truth of Jesus Christ. Until next time, God bless you.